podcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. Welcome back to the program. I'm Zev Brenner. I always enjoy having our next guest with us on a regular basis. Uh, he is a retired judge. He spent 24 years on the bench. I'm referring to attorney David Kirschblum. Um, he represented on the family court bench in cases in cloud involving Puffy Combs, Al Pacino, Mick Jagger. But we had a tremendous response when we had him on a couple of shows dealing with the Atlantic City case of fiasco. We had over 100,000 downloads for that particular broadcast. And Aftus Magazine had an article this week published by the proprietor of the program, Yossi Goldstein, whitewashing the whole affair. But welcome back to the program. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure to have my, you. My pleasure. Good to vote. And you're now a retired judge, but you're in a boutique law firm, Kirschblum, a Tabor, PC, and do a lot of interesting work. So, you know, Judge, when I go to any event, and we had you on last about six, seven weeks ago, do you know what the number one question that I have is what's going on with that pace of probe in Atlantic City? And the second question was, did he show up? Because last time you were together with Heshi Goldston, you threw out a challenge. You said, come to my office for a lie detector test, and we'll get to the bottom of this. And he said, yes, I will come. And the number one question I get after they go, what happened to the program is, did he show up for the lie detector test? So let's pick up from there. Sure. Up. So first things first, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be back on your show. And uh, I also uh, heard a lot of feedback with regard to that show. People were calling my law firm, people in my personal relationships were contacting me by WhatsApp and text, basically indicating that they had w listened to the show and they were very interested to know specifically with regard to the lie detector test. Uh, just to remind your listening audience, the uh, lie detector test we had discussed would take place on a Wednesday. This broadcast was, of course, on Motzei Shabbos. I contacted Mr. Uh, Goldstein. I was able to secure his email address to confirm on Monday, no response. On Tuesday, no response. I reminded him of the fact that lie detector tests are expensive. We would be incurring the expense, my law firm, after I discussed it with my law partner. And again, no response. I had cleared my Wednesday just in case he would just show and he did not. I followed up on Wednesday with a further email, inviting him once again to, uh, to contact me and we'd be happy to reschedule the test. I also want to remind your viewership of the fact that there was another challenge. Uh, as part of his presentation, he had said that he had made deposits with real money to many of the vendors, including the fish vendor. The, he wanted to concentrate on Shmur Matzah. I tried to gear the conversation more to the big line items of food the fish, the chicken, the beef, et cetera. And he had said that he had paid it between 20 and 25% down. That's a lot of meat, that's a lot of chicken, uh, especially because he had suggested that his uh, program was going to have several hundreds of people. And so I asked him if he can please contact those vendors and offer to donate those food items, which he never was able to have delivered, to Tom Shabbos of Flatbush, Tom Shabbos of Lakewood, and Tom Shabbos of Long Island, and of northern new jersey and he immediately said it's a great idea and he would do it well lo and behold that also was not done so both of his promises of going for a lie detector test as well as the uh company shabbos donation just did not pan out so what legal recourse do people have i understand there is a some sort of lawsuit that's pending but how is it feasible is it hard to remember he said on the show that and he was in bankruptcy and he owed a lot of money and his, his lien on his home. So what recourse do people have, not just in this situation, but any situation where you get uh, defrauded, where you put money down and the service is not delivered? Is, is it easy to collect? Is it a difficult process? Is it impossible? What's your experience? So there's two steps in, in a lawsuit. First of all is suing. And from what I understand, there has been a class action suit. There's a lawyer from northern New Jersey who is representing the class action. That's one of the lawsuits that I'm aware of. I'm not sure if there are others, but certainly the complaint can be filed. The, the uh, civil request for remuneration for compensatory damages can be filed and has been filed. The biggest problem is that oftentimes you have people who are judgment proof. So you'll secure a judgment, but then you won't be able to collect on that judgment. And that's the difficult part of this. I also want to remind the viewership that 
it came, a lot of things came out insofar as the initial deposits that the money was being WhatsApped or Zelle to a relative of Mr. Goldstein's who owned the landscaping business. Uh, from what I understand, that also trying to get that money back even from that person. I, I've seen the, the lawsuit. The lawsuit is not just Mr. Goldstein, it's Mr. Goldstein's brother, several other members of the family, REA Hospitality, etc. Uh, so again, you can file a lawsuit. That's certainly one option. The second option is to uh, request that the Attorney General's office gets involved. And because he did commerce for both New York and New Jersey, certainly the Attorney Generals for both of those states could uh, have interceded. I don't know whether uh, the victims have done that. I have been invited, and I think you will have as well. Uh, I give a lot of credit to Elon Kornblum, who is not a, a lot victim. Of exactly. Uh, he's been he started a WhatsApp group, and there's at least 50 or 60 people as part of it. They invited me on as well. And there's a very spirited conversation that takes place almost daily. What can we do? How can we do it? Recently, it came up about this article about Achtus. I saw the article. Um, I was really bothered by it, uh, especially because of the name of the of the uh, of the median being Achtos. This this unfortunately is clearly not a unity type of situation. And the fact that the magazine is called Achtos, I thought was an oxymoron. Uh, but some of the things that he was quoted as saying, uh, I took some notes down. Just uh, these really, and I wasn't a victim. You and I were on the same Pesach program, which was not in Atlantic City. But he talked about how this transcended his personal pain to be able to uh, try and correct what happened, which he's blameless of, but to ensure that there won't be victims in the future, not of him, but victims of fraud, of phishing. This whole story that there was a creation of a different website or a different Zell account, adding an extra R to the word Claridge. The money was sent there. He never saw it. This is his story, but nonetheless, he's now trying to help the common good or call you throw a raven zelaza by now starting an organization also found found uh, somewhat humorous is the fact that the initials are mma for money management awareness mma for anybody who knows is uh, is a very large organization called mixed martial arts the ufc why he picked that acronym who knows but he certainly referred to the fact that this misfortune that he encountered was a springboard to create a beneficial resource for Klai Yisrael. I have to say that um, many would, would suggest uh, that this was not a springboard of his misfortune, but the springboard of other people's misfortune. And I'm sure as we get closer through the Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur Sukkot holidays, we'll see once again in all of the Jewish journals advertising for Pesach. If anything, I would hope that this has been a good lesson for Klai Yisrael insofar as where they should be soliciting and looking for a Pesach program or any program for that matter to or ensure that this does not happen. Uh, and according to the article in Actus, which I'm just surprised, you know, it was getting quiet and now with the article appearing in Actus magazine means that people are talking about it again because certainly I got calls and WhatsApp and you did as well a text about it. So it brings it up again. And the article seems to indicate that he wants to go back into business. So the question, though, is, though, is what protection does a consumer have? Because look look what even happened in Lakewood. There was a Ponzi scheme where somebody went to, Ellie Weinstein went to prison, got pardoned by President Trump, came out, did it again. But he used a different name. So what stops an individual in a situation like this? And I don't think Heshi Golson is going to use his name to promote a program, but he probably will do it again. So what protections does the consumer have from being fleeced in such a situation? Not many. Uh, certainly if the attorney generals were to have been involved and would have found criminality, then you stop him because then he'd be behind the jail cell. Right now, the pending lawsuit is a civil lawsuit. So even if by chance they are able to secure and they already have secured certain remedies from that court system. The fact is, is and uh, I'm sure you saw this as well. He filed recently a motion for reconsideration. The judge blanketly just denied it with a big deny stamp right in front because he wanted to try get, to get uh, the case back before that honorable judge. But insofar as what victims can do to protect themselves, because there has not been a criminal proceeding commenced and he's be He's been found guilty of criminality. What you need to do to ensure that this doesn't happen anymore is to be wise before you solicit, 
go-to major companies that have been in this business for a long time. Uh, I believe that you had a guest on your last show uh, that runs a program or a Pesach uh, journal of, of many of the programs. Make sure that you speak to people who have gone to these programs and that it's it's a real program and a program that they'll stand behind their product. We, we all know that in, in April of 2020, every program had to shut down within minutes simply because of the COVID outbreak. But the Costa Ricas and, and all the, and I don't want to give uh, credit to one particular program, but all the programs that were legitimate programs, they did right by their consumers. And then they were able to go back into business. The fact that Heshi allegedly did these things, these wrongdoings, doesn't stop him from going back in business. He can have a pseudonym. He can create some kind of shell LLC. And if the consumer doesn't research who exactly this company is, they can easily fall prey once again to the same scheme of sending in money and then either having a program that is subpar or a program that doesn't exist at all. Right. And I would say the majority of the programs more or less, you know, do what they say they're going to do. Some are higher end, some are not. Um, but, and then again, you do find some that where you have this kind of situation where people lose money, where they come to the program and there's no food. And we had somebody, a lawyer, who sued a program and actually won because the program felt that uh, that who's this person to sue is going to lose in court, and they actually won. Uh, that was a couple of weeks ago. So you can check it out online. There was Miriam Burfus and her son uh, that were on the air. But what you're basically saying is, though, is that the consumer really has to do their homework. There is no other remedy protection unless you do your homework, because even if you get fleeced, it's hard to collect. Absolutely. The, the adage of let the buyer beware certainly is prevailing. Caveat emptor. If you don't do your research, you can certainly fall victim to these types of situations, just like in any type of business dealing. You want to make sure and it's interesting because as part of the article, and I urge people to read this article, but take from it what you can, glean from it the positive things, not his own self-promotion, but the fact that there are a lot of different uh, industries where you're sending money. I actually tried to buy Nick tickets during Nick playoffs. I ended up falling prey to a Zell uh, seller who wasn't a real seller. It, it happens in every industry, but at the end of the day, if you are careful and you use legitimate companies, you hopefully will get your bank for the buck. Hopefully. And with the other thing, of course, that we see a lot in the community is Ponzi schemes. And the, ones, the one in Lakewood certainly has gotten a lot of media attention. And some very smart people have lost money. I know there's a five towns Ponzi scheme where some very, very prominent people that people know their names without my mentioning it right now have lost significant sums of money. And uh, again, there seems to be little recourse in getting some of that money back. Right. Uh, I, I have certainly seen from my years on the bench and doing matrimonial family law, but even more so doing trust in estates as my law firm practice, uh, one of the two areas that we represent. Money, unfortunately, is the root of evil. And there is a lot of greed out there. And therefore, even the intelligent, unfortunately, sometimes they lose their mind in trying to pursue the securing of money or the taking of money. And victims who believe that they're going to get a better yield because they're going to go through not a major uh, investment bank or uh, investment company, but th it's too good to be true. 14, 15, 25% as a return on investment, too good to be true. And they will lure you with a small investment and give you the money back all for them to just land you and to ultimately get a very large investment. And then all of a sudden your money is gone. But, but the problem is, is that the reason why smart people fall prey to it, uh, the judge, is because if you're going to shore with somebody for 20 years, 15 years, whatever the number is, and you're making a l'chaim with him and you're social with him, and if he says, hey, listen, judge, I got a great deal for you. We're going to give you 15%, 20% return. You're not going to do your due diligence. It's called affinity targeting. You're going to say, I know this guy. I've been with this guy. He's not going to screw me. I'm, we're, we're buddies almost, right? And But it I, happens time and again. I would have hoped that this would never have happened in the first place. But all you have to do is listen to a show such as yours and open up a Jewish paper and see these types of events, these types of Ponzi schemes. Just go back to Bernie Madoff, who unfortunately was a member of the tribe. You would think that over time, people would be a little bit more 
hesitant simply because their neighbor, their friend, somebody from a different Jewish community has fallen, fallen prey. And therefore, you're right. When you're sitting with someone in shul and they're telling you, or you see they're driving a really fancy car or taking exotic vacations or building extensions to their home, you naturally assume they must be making a lot of money. And therefore, if they have an investment opportunity, then that's an investment opportunity that's going to net me a greater reward. One of the things that I found very interesting, and in, again, in my own practice doing matrimonial law, it's not always what it appears to be. When I will receive a net worth statement, and all of a sudden, someone who has so many different possessions, but they don't own any of them. It's either in a company, or it's owned by a parent, or it's owned by someone else. And all of a sudden, their net worth is much, much less than they're representing it to be. So I urge people to just understand the idea of a Ponzi scheme, and all of these investments are unfortunately a situation where an individual or a company is representing themselves to be something that they're not they're just not and you find you do a lot of matrimonial work in divorce cases we're going to talk about divorce a little later on as well has that also been have you seen schemes i guess lots of times a spouse knows where the money is buried so to speak and sometimes people get into trouble when they end up in a divorce situation absolutely and and oftentimes you have a a spouse who is not aware you have housewives who just don't get involved in the economics of the home and therefore they just assume with bills being paid that everything is okay but they really don't know what they have or what they don't have the dangerous part when it comes to matrimonial law is that especially when it's tax time a joint tax return will be then proffered by one spouse to another and say here sign here and then when you're signing your name as the spouse sometimes the unknowing victimless spouse uh, they're signing their name and their, their culpability their responsibility is the same as the person who knows what they're doing so again people have to be very wary have to be very careful and it's absolutely appropriate my wife has done it to me and asking me, tell me about our finances. Tell us about, tell me about your, our spending. Tell me what we have. And it's a fair conversation that a husband and wife should have. But let me ask you a question. In case of a divorce where one spouse signs off and then they get separated and they find that the other side was doing all kinds of tax shenanigans, is the government sympathetic to a spouse saying, I didn't know, I just signed off because the other party took care of the finances? I would, I would usually say yes, but not always the case. Uh, the bigger question is, would the judge be sympathetic? Because Were you sympathetic? Someone... Oh, you, you didn't deal with that. You did. Oh, with... I, no, I did. I, I would like to believe that I was very sympathetic. I was the most honest, sincere, <laughs> hardworking, sedic, sedic, to dof judge that you've ever seen. But in, in fairness, when a spouse is acknowledging a very low income, if that line seven of a 1040 form says $50,000, when obviously someone's making a lot more than that, what you're in essence then doing is acknowledging that your spouse only makes $50,000. So then you end up getting divorced and the wife says, he makes so much money, I want child support that's commensurate with what he makes. I want spouse support commensurate, commensurate with what he makes. And the matrimonial lawyer who's representing the husband will immediately say, what do you mean? His tax return said $50,000. You agreed that it was $50,000. Lo and behold, you signed off on that return. So be careful, be wary. We're speaking with Judge David Kirschblum. He has been on the bench over 24 years now in private practice with Orly Tabor. The firm is called Kirschblum Tabor PC. We're looking at some situations that are unfortunate where people have lost money, either being scammed or not doing their proper homework. And when we come back, we'll continue our conversation. And if you'd like to chime in, if you have lost money or have any questions for the judge here's a unique opportunity to have your questions answered email of course is a wonderful way zev at talklinenetwork.com zev at talklinenetwork.com you can also call us at 212-769-1925 212-769-1925 coming up a little later on we'll speak to rachel evans a member of broken ties we'll speak to Bitsalo rothstein also for that organization we'll speak to Rafale, somebody going through a bitter divorce baruch nemtsov went through a divorce we'll look at the male perspective in the divorce proceedings and somehow some feel that it's stacked against men in some cases not obviously in all cases we'll look at that as well again we're going to be right back again our numbers are 212-769-1925 we'll be right back don't go away
And you're listening to the Talk Line Network over WSNR, 620 AM, Metro New York, WVIP, 93.5 FM, HD2, Metro New York, WJPR, 1640 AM in Highland Park in Edison, New Jersey, TalklineNetwork.com, and our 24-hour-day listen line, which you can access on your cell phone. That's the best way to access that, 641-793-0382. 641-793-0382. And that's the talkline network.com. That's talkline network.com. Also a great way to get our programming. Thank you for listening to this episode of Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. Please call us with your questions and comments at 212-769-1925. That's 212-769-1925. Or email us at zevbrenner at gmail.com. And we're back. Our guest is Judge David Kurt. Actually, he's a former judge. He's now an attorney in private practice but he spent over 24 years on the family court bench, including presiding over many famous cases. And of course, we're dealing with topics that are local to us, dealing with whether it's a divorce or family proceedings or just business, you know, or going away for a Pesach vacation or a kosher vacation, some of the do's and don'ts that are so important because people have lost lots and lots of money and lots of them can't afford to, to lose. Nobody should be taking money in a fraudulent way. And, of course, we were looking at the Atlantic City Pacelift program as well because a lot of people have expressed interest, and that's been revived because of an article in Achtos magazine where it seems to whitewash the situation. Um, David, do you get a lot of response people say to you? Like, what did Heshi show up for the lie detector test? Did you getting a lot of calls about that? I did. I, I received phone calls uh, immediately after our broadcast, uh, certainly insofar as the uh, lie detector test. Then I received phone calls because apparently there was some yeshiva, I believe, that his children were attending, that he was the guest of honor and want to know what the recourse with regard to that was. Then, of course, Optus Magazine resurrected it again. And in, in addition to it, the victims. And we're not talking about 5, 10, 20 people. We're talking about a lot of people who are victimized. And they certainly wanted to know what the recourse was. They did ask me about the class action lawyer. Uh, I do not know him personally, uh, but I do know that some of them did retain uh, Mr. Epstein, who is the class action lawyer. Uh, and just for various uh, other reasons, they wanted to just, it, it seems that this story just resonated with a lot of people and for good reason. Nobody wants to spend money and not get their due consideration, and especially something like Pesach. There was that element uh, initially of, well, if you go to a Pesach program, you can certainly afford it because Pesach programs are expensive. But then they understood that that wasn't necessarily the case. When some of the victim stories came out, people who had uh, sick relatives but were good were able at least enough to be able to come to a program, even if they were in wheelchairs or otherwise, because they couldn't manage putting together Pesach for themselves. And the way that that particular program was advertised and even Heshi in this this after this article suggested he didn't go back to Cartwright because it would have been too expensive. He was trying to market himself to a different class of people. Well, unfortunately, even more so uh, when you're talking about a class of people who can't afford the Cartwright, but at the same time is are paying their hard earned money. Uh, sometimes they're using insurance money or other means to be able to pay for this. And then they end up with not a program to go to. Shame on him. If indeed there was wrongdoing on his part, even more so, that type of person, you just don't hurt. It's just it's just plain wrong. I also want to just give recognition that there were some Pesach proprietors. I think Yassi Zulaski uh, was one of them that took those victims, in part, some of them, into their own program because they felt hard uh, that these people were victimized, that they had nowhere to go. And therefore, if there was space allowable within their own program to take them in, they did do just that. No, it's important because people have, listen, I've had a ton of response. And I said we had 100,000 downloads to that show. I've had uh, 
a couple that lost their child and what's going on in the program and they were heartbroken. They lost money on it. And you had others, you had Holocaust survivors, people who cannot afford to lose that kind of money, any kind of money, um, because they're living on a day-to-day basis on a limited and fixed income. So our hearts go out. And the reason why we keep doing these programming is that people should be aware and be vigilant because not everything is as, as it's advertised. You have to do your homework. And uh, and unfortunately, these things are going to continue to happen because that's just human nature. And look at the Ponzi schemes. We're talking about so many millions of dollars and smart people. And you see it in all different neighborhoods where this is taking place. I mean, uh, there are unfortunately more stories in the pipeline like that. But smart people have made some stupid mistakes. As yeah, it's, 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 it's indeed true. Look, one of the first things that you lo- learn when you're in law school and then when you open up a business is that if you have an escrow account, an IOLA account, this is other people's money, OPM. You cannot touch that money. Well, how many lawyers do we know that ended up being charged with dipping into the IOLA account because it just was too too attractive? They were having hard times. They thought nobody would know. I could dip into it. I could take 20, 50, or who knows how many thousands of dollars, put it back eventually, but I just need a short-term loan so I'll take it out of my escrow account. It's the most foolish thing that a lawyer could do. And yet you have lawyers who do just that. So people get desperate and people get greedy. People really don't understand. And again, in my practice, especially when we're dealing with estates and probating of estates and you just do an inventory of assets and all of a sudden things are disappearing. It's amazing. And these are from people at times that are perpetrating these types of wrongdoings they're taking money that's not theirs, and they hope that, that they're not going to be found. And then as religious people, what do we believe? That Hashem's looking at you too, and yet these people think they're not going to be found. So how religious are they when Hashem, our creator, is seeing exactly what they're doing, but yet they seem to just do it just the same? Is it more prominent in trust in the states? Than uh, other areas? I'd, like to say, no, I'd like to say it's uh, it's it's prominent, unfortunately, in, in all of the areas that my firm practices, which is trust and estates and matrimonial and family law in particular. But I've heard from from colleagues who uh, practice in real estate and in uh, landlord tenant and commercial transactive work. Um, unfortunately, just because you wear a yarmulke or a black hat and a white shirt and a pair of uh, Shabbos pants doesn't mean that you are straight and and you're doing things uh by the book unfortunately so what are some of the interesting things that you're involved with these days you mentioned matrimonial law is that the bulk of your practice right now that you're out of family court so i am one of two partners in my law firm we have paralegals we have a secretary and we do both areas and we do it collaboratively because one of the things that i was my ideal after being on the bench for 25 years and seeing, unfortunately, a lot of lawyers unprepared coming into my courtroom, which while I was, I tried to be nice, that would really get under my skin because you have, again, clients who are paying your retainer and you're coming in and either you don't know what you're talking about, you don't even know the name of the child, or it's not your area of focus. That whole uh, line of, I'm a general practitioner, which I always say is that you know a little bit about everything, but you really don't know much about anything uh, versus the specialists who do specifically matrimonial family law or the specialists who do trust and estates. I took a partner who exclusively did trust and estates work that includes probate, includes administration, but it also is estate planning, uh, powers of attorney, healthcare proxies, wills, trusts, revocable, irrevocable, special needs trusts. So that is one area of the two areas of law that we do. And the other one is matrimonial and family law. And the one thing that we decided, both my partner and myself, is that we're gonna work collaboratively because while we have these support staff, we answer our own phones. So if you call our phone number, even at times, except of course Shabbos, even off hours, one of us is going to answer and then we update the other through a program so that we're both acclimated to every single case we have. Now, my question, you raised something. When you were a judge, you saw a lot of lawyers come in unprepared, didn't know the name of the child, didn't know the case, and they're just making an appearance. What recourse does an individual have when their lawyer does something like that and, and, and malpractice? Is that easier to prove in the, these days? Now, it used to be a lot tougher. Is it any change or is it the same problem still exist? So it's it's a little bit of a problem, but there were a couple of things that I did as the, as the jurist 
uh, one of the things that, that you have as a judge is that you have the ability to go on the record and off the record, which means that the stenographer or the digital minutes can be stopped. So I was careful what I would do, but at times I would either give that look to the client, to the litigant, or I would say something, not over the top like you hired an idiot, but <laughs> a little bit more diplomatically, but to let them know maybe you would like to change representation because the guy that or the woman who you have hired doesn't really know what they're talking about. I can do that in many ways and I could do it very passively. I could do it actively. One of the things that I had was always the statutes on my bench and my court officers knew just what I wanted them to do. And sometimes I would actually have them take the statute off my bench, put it in front of counsel and say, please advise the court of what exactly you're talking about. Find the section in the Family Court Act and the domestic relations law that supports your proposition because the proposition was ridiculous and they would never be able to find it. I don't even think that they had opened up a family court act or a domestic relations law. So statutory and case law was not their uh, strong suit. But insofar as recourse, if they have been badly represented, well, two things, you could file malpractice action. Uh, you could also cite them with the New York State Bar Association so that the bar knows that this is someone who did not serve your interest, took your money and didn't practice law in the way they should have. Judge, if people want to get in touch with you, learn more about your matrimonial practice or the other issues of law that you practice, how can they do so? So there's two great ways. Uh, number one is that they can email me. Uh, my website is KT, as in Kentucky, Tennessee, lawgroup.com. My uh, email address is david at ktlawgroup.com. My partner is Orly, O-R-L-Y, at ktlawgroup.com. They can look at the website. It tells a lot of background of who we are, what we do, what we specialize in. And they can also call the phone number. Phone number is 516-545-0059. They could also look at Google and it'd be pretty, since we're spending some money on social media and advertising, uh, they can probably find us that way. And luckily we have really good reviews, so they can certainly circle through that as well. Judge uh, David Kirschman, we look forward to having you back. Thank you for sharing some insight on how people should protect themselves from scams and going away on vacation. And that other vacation turns into a real nightmare. I appreciate our time. And thank you so much. Thank you. Shabbat. Uh, Shabbat. Judge David Kirschman, him here on.